And we are live. Welcome, mystery and thriller fans. I'm your on-air host, Sarah DeVello, and I am thrilled, pun intended, to be hosting the incredible Jocelyn Jackson live from Atlanta today about her blazing new book, Mother May I, which is getting all sorts of rave reviews. And we are here to chat with her live and get the inside scoop on this blazing new book. Jocelyn, welcome to Mystery and Thrillers. Tell us about your book. Oh, Sarah, thank you so much for having me. I'm really, really excited to be here. Um, so Mother May I is the story of what happens when you blink. Um, anyone who's ever been in charge of a child for more than 15 seconds has had that experience. You look away, they're just gone. Um, and you know, 90% of the time they're in a bush looking at a weird bug, it's fine. But um, but for Brie Cabot, it's not fine. Where her baby was is a note that says, go home. Don't call your husband. Don't call the police if you ever want to see your child again. The kidnapper is another mother um, who has, it's not a straight up kidnap and ransom book. If you've ever read any of my novels, you know that in my books, the past has teeth. The past has a pulse. It's coming for Brie. And um, and that's where it starts off. Ooh, well, I am reading it uh, myself, and I have to say, I am completely sucked in, and I want to get into every dirty detail of it, but I just want to pause and welcome all of our friends on Facebook. Welcome, everybody. If you've been here before, you know the drill, and if you're new, welcome. We're thrilled to have you. Here's the drill. Every Tuesday, I present you with two featured mystery and thriller authors, and you get to ask them anything. This is your chance to have one-on-one -on -one time with this new New York Times bestselling author, Ms. Jocelyn Jackson. You can ask her about her writing process, about her books, anything that's weighing on your brain, because what happens on Mighty Mysteries stays on Mighty Mysteries. It's like Vegas for books. So get those questions going in the comments. They're already pouring in. Welcome, Amy. Welcome, Anissa. Welcome, Patty. Um, welcome, everybody. Welcome, Gail. Hi. Welcome back. Welcome, Kim. Um, Anissa is saying, Mother May I is so good. Um, Thank you for that, Anissa. Um, and this is getting rave reviews. So most recently, Anissa is saying, hi, Jocelyn and Sarah. Hi, Anissa. Welcome. We're happy to have you. Top community member there. Jennifer saying she can't wait to read it. We can't wait for you to read it too. Jennifer, come back and tell us what you think. Gail, top community member saying, hi, hi, Gail. Welcome back. So you are getting, uh, you have are earning, excuse me, you are earning rave reviews most recently from the Wall Street Journal which said that this is the thinking and feeling person's thriller, a literary dream. Congratulations on that. Tell us about uh, what was what it was like to get that review. Well, it was weird because like every now, you know, I, I don't think, I'm not a person who puts a huge amount of stock in reviews because it really is a conversation between the reader and the writer. And Ooh. you hope that, and I don't have any place in that conversation, right? Like I had my conversation with the book when I wrote it and now it's time for reviewers and readers to have a conversation. But if I had said like hashtag goals, like here's what I'm setting out to do. It would be, I want to write a thriller for thinking and feeling people. I want to write a literary beach read. I want to write a book that you can make a giant margarita and go down to the beach and have a good time or read it with your book club and talk a lot about do we have a class system in America and who gets second chances and how is are we really the land of opportunity anymore? What does upward mobility look like? What does downward mobility look like? And how are these things? Like there's all this stuff that you can talk about. Oh, so timely and sadly also timeless topics that you're bringing up there, Jocelyn, um, all of these things. And I love when mystery and thriller authors take the opportunity to not only spin a tale that sucks us in and keeps those pages turning until 3 a.m., but also address this really weighty issues that we're wrestling with socially, societally, culturally. Um, so thank you for, for that. Um, and get, reading a little Me Too movement here. So such important issues that we that we need to be that we need to be talking about. And clearly it is resonating uh, not just with The Wall Street Journal, but with all of the reviews that you are earning. So how long did it take you to write this book? It takes me about a year and a half to write a book. I'm trying to 
I, I, I was going to try and be faster. Like I want to be able to write a book in a year. Um, but instead, like my, my daughter was going off to college this year and I thought, you know, I can have more work hours and da da da. And then we had this pandemic and she took a gap year. And so like, mm, it still took me a year and a half, but maybe that's just what it takes me. Ooh, okay, cool. Love that insight. Um, Kim is saying that she is a huge fan of your work, that Hi, you Kim. are such a, a talented uh, writer. Thanks, Kim, for sharing. We're so happy to have you. Anissa is wondering, what was the inspiration for the bunker at the amusement park? Ooh, Anissa, great question. Jocelyn, give us the inside scoop there. Oh, I, I tell you what, yeah, there's a there's a there's a defunct amusement park that plays a big creepy part in this book it's it's one of my favorite like scenes or set pieces like this idea of this scene all playing out at this decrepit decaying amusement park in rural georgia that used to be like a little fun time attraction you might stop at like it's kind of the, the kind of place you stop at on the way to something else like you never go there um like on purpose just like we're gonna go here um but they do have like a a, a ruined carousel that's rotting into chunks and mm -hmm. um First of all, there was a, a photographer who did, oh gosh, I wish I could remember his name, Michael, uh, I should have looked this up, Michael, mm, and it was the, it was a series of photographs of, that where he just went to defunct places in America Ooh. that places that have been abandoned and are rotting down, and he did amusement parks, and he did like trains, like defunct trains and trolley stations theaters that have closed down it's all so creepy and when i looked at these photographs like I'm, I'm a visual arts person i love museums i love the visual arts so when i looked at these photographs i knew like i wanted to set a big spooky part of this book at a piece of america that's like rotting into disrepair it's Ooh. Really <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that is super creepy. And the scene where a very, a very important scene in the book, which we won't say what it is because we don't want to give any spoilers away, takes place at this super creepy location. And Anissa, great question. Cause I was also wondering, is that a real place or, you know, why? So thank you for it's that. It's based on a real place. I mean, it's based on a real place. I, I, I you know, I love hands on research. Um, it's been, that's been one of the worst things about the pandemic is most of my re research is, like I like to go to actual places and see what they smell like and touch stuff. And I like to meet people who do the actual jobs and talk with them, do lots of interviews. That's been really hard. So choosing abandoned places to research and go to where there's no people there was pretty, pretty smart actually. <laughs> yeah. Right, exactly. That's just pande hashtag pandemic life. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Exactly. Oh my gosh. Susie Q is saying, hi friends. Hi Susie. Great to have you here. Um, so Justin, let me ask you this. You are known for, I'm going to pull up one of your reviews here. The, um, the Atlanta journal constitution, um, praises your ability to write fast paced and twisty books, um, with a bit of redemption, redemption and grace down the road. Um, let's talk about how, what do you think the secret to writing a fast paced and twisty book? Cause you, you actually segued over to mysteries and thrillers. Um, I did. yeah. So tell us, but you're, you're clearly winning the genre. How do you write that? Do you plot it all out? Do you see where the scene takes you? Give us the skinny. Um, I'm a pantser, you know, in the vernacular. I I know the characters really, really well, and then I just set one of them on fire, and I see how things <laughs> unfold from there. Um, for me, honestly, you know, I wrote Southern Fiction for about eight books, and now I've written two um, domestic suspense or thrillers. Um, it really wasn't that big a transition for me. Like, if you look at my Southern Fiction books, all eight of them, I'm murdering people. There's always elements of a mystery. There's, I, I either use the engine of a mystery or a thriller. Like I use a, a commercial engine like that. And I think that part of it was just that I'm Southern and I want people to think I'm real nice. I'm not, I'm not real nice. Um, and so I was afraid to let those elements that I really enjoyed in my Southern fiction take front seat. And when I reached a certain age, my give a crapper broke. 
And I just kept caring if you think I'm nice. And I started writing like it really is like it's all the themes. If you like my earlier books, I, I'm still interested in all the themes I've always been interested in. I still write the same kinds of complicated, especially female characters who act instead of reacting. Like all the elements mm. of one of my books is there. It's just I've moved the action I've raised the volume on the action and, and like put a zoom in the pacing. So, um, so it, I don't know. It doesn't feel that different to me. It feels like this is the same kind of books I was writing before, just a little unleashed. Ooh, unleashed. I love it. Now, how do you actually put that zoom in the book? How do you do that? Um, not being afraid to start in Medea's rest, you know, in, as in the theater, they said that in the center of the action, like not being afraid to just leap right in and trusting the reader Ooh. to go with you and like being able to put fit the exposition in later. So things start. And, and I think a really important thing is finding a voice of a character, because when you start the action that quickly, the big risk is that nobody cares. Like here's some person in some jeopardy. Like you have to care about the person immediately. And I yeah. think that's a question of voice. You think that's a question of voice? A function of voice. Yeah. Function. Like with, with the right voiciness in just a couple of lines, you can get a sense of who someone is and decide if you're interested in them. And then like, if you're interested in someone or it, it, it's not even necessarily like, although I do, I do really like Bree, the narrator of this. Um, I, I'm not, always, that's not always a goal of mine is to make my narrator super likable. I want them to be super interesting, but I really do like her. Like I would go to lunch with her and I think she's interesting. So that's nice. But you want the person to be intriguing and have some charisma and have something mm. about them that you want to invest in and care about. Absolutely. I, I And I agree. I really like Brie. It's actually tough for me to connect with uh, with a character who's who's not traditionally likable. I find Brie very likable. I would, I would go to lunch with her or God forbid if I was ever in a kidnapping situation, I'd call her because clearly she knows how to handle the situation. Uh, welcome, Carrie. Welcome, Sylvia. Welcome, Kim. Welcome, Susan. Welcome, everybody. Great to have you here. Sylvia is saying, I never think of the bat of Batman the same thanks to Ms. Jackson. Ms. Jackson, what what's going on here? Tell us the Batman thing. So that's, there's a book I wrote called The Almost Sisters that begins when a, a comic book artist. I like writing women who have interesting jobs, oftentimes mm. in the arts. And she's a comic book artist, which is a very male dominated uh, profession. And she goes to like Comic-Con has a really bad time, runs into an export for like, it's just really a bad time, gets super drunk, takes a Batman up to her room and gets pregnant with Batman's baby. And that's all she knows about him. Because <laughs> he didn't really take the head off. <laughs> you know, like it was kind of one of those. Whoops, really oh bad. <laughs> really a lot of tequila, really bad life choices. So she gets pregnant with Batman's baby on the first few pages. So and it's oh super hard for Batman. Okay. Now, none of us are ever going to think of Batman the same. Thank you. So maybe much. we are. Maybe we already kind of thought that way about Batman. Some of us. <laughs> I'm not saying you. Well, okay. Can start, can, not saying who. I think we know who. Start telling us in the comments. <laughs> what do you think about Batman? Thank you, Sylvia. Thank you for that fabulous question. Uh, comment, rather. Thank you, Jocelyn, for the inside scoop. Anissa is saying she needs to find this book of defunct amusement parks. It sounds so interesting. Um, you said yeah. it was an article. Was it an article or a book? No, no, it's neither. It's a series of photographs by an art photographer. Um, oh, perfect. Yeah, so he's he's an artist. He's done a bunch of stuff, and they did actually make it into a book. Um, I saw his stuff in a gallery, um, and I I've, I've never seen the originals. Like, there's a little gallery near my house that was selling some prints of his, which is how I became aware of him. Like, I saw the. I like to go to little museums and art galleries, and this. This gallery had like eight of his from the series, not the originals, just, I mean, I don't know if photographs have originals. I'm not, I'm more of a painting, I don't know anything about photography, except I like to look at it. So they're signed, you know, copies of these photographs. And so then he got on my radar, I looked him up on the interwebs, then I saw there was a book, and I got kind of really into looking at the whole series. 
Oh, very cool. And he's also saying she also saying she loved Brie. I did too. Um, and the reason that I think I'm so sucked in is that, you know, you open with this very powerful, impossibly difficult situation where her child goes missing, has been kidnapped, and she has to make the choice of whether to follow the instructions of not calling the police, not calling her husband, not telling anyone in hopes that if she follows these instructions, she'll get her baby back. Or, you know, whether we do, whether to do what, you know, we're quote unquote supposed to do, which is to, of course, call the authorities. And I couldn't stop thinking, what would I do in that situation? Would I trust the kidnapper, not exactly a paragon of trust, (laughs) or would I do what I've been trained to do, which is to alert the authorities, call the police, the FBI, whoever you would call. Um, And it was, I can't stop thinking about this. So uh, audience, tell us what you would do. Would you call the police? Would you try to handle it yourself? Uh, Bree tries to handle it herself. What did you ever think about having her disobey the quote unquote rules, Jocelyn, or you were like, she's a rebel. She's going to do her own thing. Well, I mean, Brie has, um, okay. I just have to go back. I had to look it up while you were talking. It's abandoned America. I could not think of it. Okay, I'll put that in the comments. Abandoned America. And it's like, um, the, the photographer's name is Michael. I can't, I still can't remember. Anyway, um, Brie it has a theater background. So she started out wanting to be a professional actor and being a theater major at college in Georgia mm-hmm. and met Trey and ended up getting married and being a stay at home wife and mom instead. And Brie's been pretty upwardly mobile. Like yeah. she grew up like on the bottom rung of the middle class, like not like that. You know, she was never food insecure and they had a roof over their heads. But like if the car broke down, that could ruin their life for six weeks and change what they could eat or do, you know, really tight budget. Um, but she's been really very upwardly mobile. And the the kidnapper has come up in the same background and her family has had different luck and kind of gone the other way. Mm. And so like to me, one of the most interesting things about the book was there's this weird empathy that grows between the two of them. Like when this starts, yeah. the kidnapper is thinking, Oh, She's just some rich wench, you know, trophy <laughs> wife. And she, as they come to know each other, as they are get involved in this whole thing, like they start to see how they're the same. And each of them is fighting for her own child. So even though this weird empathy happens, like they're still headed for conflagration. There's no peace mm-hmm. if you're fighting for your child. And the way Brie gets through it is that she did have this theater background. She was a theater major. She has worked as an actor professionally. And so she calls up all those old, she's now 38, so it's been 20 years, but she calls up all those old skills to do the things that the kid never wants her to do to sort of put things right. That that makes sense. So she's improvising. She's committing to the scene. (laughs) Yes, and. <laughs> yes, and. Isn't that what you always have to say? Yes, and and, yes, yes. absolutely. And um, Margaret Pinard, my, our fellow blazer and author, is chiming in from YouTube. She's saying it's Abandoned America by Matthew Christopher. We've Matthew solved. Matthew Christopher. I was saying Christopher something. Yes. Matthew Christopher, Abandoned America. Okay, we've solved one mystery here on Mighty Mystery. So that I so I can't remember that. I can't I've got the book like two rooms over. I've looked at so many of his things, but I you know, when sometimes right, especially when you really need your brain not to fail, your brain just fails. And actually, I just learned that that's called tip of the tongue syndrome. And I learned that from my dear friend, uh, the neuroscientist, Dr. Lisa Genova, who's coming on the blaze later this month to talk about her brand new book, Remember, which is about how the brain works and why that happens. Um, oh, that's it's fascinating. Yeah. So she um, she st- she has written a lot of books, including Still Alice, which is about early onset Alzheimer's. And she yeah. explains why that happens. And now I feel much better when that happens to me. <laughs> um, okay. I am scrolling through the comments here. And Gail saying she would call the police. She wouldn't try to hack this on her own. Gail, I think I'm with you. <laughs> um, but we love following um, oh, and Gail saying also, oh, Gail, thank you. She's also saying that Matthew Christopher is the photographer of America. Gail, top community member, earning those badges. Wait. Thank you, ma'am. Here's um, the thing, Gail, that is true. I probably would call the police as well. Maybe. I'm, I'm probably on the cusp, and I've been middle class a long time. But the truth is, the more, the more 
the higher in the middle class you are, the more likely you are to call the police because you have more trust for the police and your experiences with the police have been very positive. If you come out of a place of poverty, you're much less likely to call the police and you're much, much less likely to trust them. Like if it was Bree's husband, who's always been wealthy, raised in affluence, he would have called the police immediately. Bree, she's on that cusp. Like she's now, you know, she's now upper middle class, but where she comes from, the police are not who you trust. She also has a childhood friend who ended up becoming police. He's now retired into private security. So she calls Marshall. So it's not like she's just like, I'm just going to Batman this because I'm a housewife. <laughs> She does get help. So, and Marshall is the other um, narrator of the book, and I love him. <laughs> I, I could tell as I was reading that you loved him. I also just want to pause and acknowledge that there's also um, there's also a racial divide in terms of trusting the police, and we've been we are yes. coming to a, a reckoning with that, an awareness of that, that and a discussion about that nationally, which we've never had before, which is long yes. overdue desperately needed um, as we're seeing the um, the the mistrust, the distrust deservedly so um, from our beloved black community who has been systematically mistreated and 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 and, and right. not and able to trust the police. So we're seeing that as well. And I just want to acknowledge that oh, as yeah. well. That's certainly a thing that the book is looking at as well. Marshall's wife is a woman of color. His daughter is mixed race. And there's there's some other there's a lawyer in the book who also sort of becomes an ally from um, from the the adjacent firm mm. who is a person of color. So this is like this is a book. That, yeah, like there's who who will call the police and who can find it safe to call the police. Like this is a this is definitely a thing that the book is interested in looking at. Absolutely. Mm -hmm. Margaret saying, what a juicy, timely vein to tap. Thank you, Jocelyn, for going there. Well said, Margaret. Thank you so much for that comment. Um, oh, Margaret's also saying, well said, Sarah. Thank you so much, Margaret. Really appreciate your presence and your comments. Um, ma welcome, Mary Webby Weber O'Malley, a Blaze member and a professional books bookseller. Great to have you here. Um, so tell us um, more, Jocelyn, as you were writing this book, you said you're a pantser. So, so that means not plotting it out. You're seeing where the story takes you. Were you surprised where the story took you? I always am. Um, I always think I know where I'm going. Like I don't have an outline like this chapter, this chapter, this chapter, but I think I know where I'm going. Um, and I know that a book is really working for me when my characters start to do things that won't take me to that place that I think I'm walking toward. And th especially mm. if the things they want to do are making me intensely uncomfortable, that's the book. Because I think, you know, the, all the stuff that I'm scared to write about that really matters, like all my deepest fears, which you've got to tap into to write a thriller and all the stuff that is just uncomfortable that I want to write about as a person who's writing like the thinking person's thriller is is all that stuff that is in the, like down here in your reptile brain where you're too scared to think about it directly. So the way I think about these deep fears is through the lens of story. And mm. so I'll start out in a place that maybe feels safe and my characters who come from back here will want to take me into the places where I'm really afraid. And I have to listen to that and revise that. I've learned that if I don't listen to it, if I fight them, if I'm like, no, I'm not going there. Everything I write from the point I willfully stop doing that is just going to be crap. I'm just going to need to throw it out. It's nothing I care about. It's mm. boring and fake. So I, I have, I, I can't say that I never, I never shy away. I'll just say that I usually give up trying to shy away faster. <laughs> Oh, I love that. Uh, Mary's saying a very special hi to you and also that you are the best, all caps, narrator of your own audiobook. So I just was having this conversation on Facebook last night about your book um, in the Thrillaholics, a mystery and thriller fan book club. And, um, and I was saying that I especially love to hear an author narrate her own books because I want to hear it from the brain, from the voice of the person who wrote it, you um, narrate us, tell it, narrate your own book. Tell us about that. Okay. I really, oh, this is, it's ironic. It's ironic, but I don't really love it when an author narrates their own books. 99 oh. times out of a hundred. I don't think they should. I think you should mm. get an actor to do it. Like unless you're Neil Gaiman 
or there's or an author who's just really freaking good at it mm -hmm. i i do my own because i started out in theater i've done voice acting like i've i've done tons of voice acting before i ever published a novel i even did like some stuff for pbs like I, i've been a voice actor so and i've had classes in it i've had training i've had theater training my first degree is in theater so I am I I am an actor as well. I mean I don't really the only acting I do is writing, but like I've I've won awards. Now other publishing houses will hire me to read some of their books sometimes, which I do if I have time and love the book. I would love to do it more because it is a great joy to me, but it's time consuming and I have a deadline. So I, I think that I think it's better to have a, a reader who can do the voices and understands the pacing and hits the highs and lows. Hmm. Some actors, like, um, I mean, some writers are very, like most of us are super introverted mm -hmm. under the bed kind of people. And you don't, you don't want somebody who's like the calendar. Can I, uh, uh, uh. <laughs> you want somebody who will, yeah. you know, commit yeah. endlessly, commit shamelessly to doing all the, the parts and, reading the dirty parts out loud and whatever mm. it takes. So I, I'm, I'm pretty, I guess as an actor, I want actors to read audiobooks and writers to write audiobooks. but I'm, I'm just, I'm lucky in that I'm a person that started with one skill set and moved to another. Very cool. Well, Mary's saying she doesn't love it when most read their own, most authors read their own either, but you Jocelyn are perfect. High praise from from Mary there, uh, Margaret from YouTube chiming, chiming in that Jocelyn Jackson does sound like an amazing stage name. <laughs> it does, but it's is actually your stage name, Jocelyn? name. It is the name I was born with. Um, I, <laughs> that is, and it was spelled that way and pronounced that way. Like my mom, which has been very useful for me. Like my, my name, Jocelyn is usually spelled with a C and it's French. Yeah. My mom misspelled it somehow. And um, that's been really great because I've been able to get Jocelyn Jackson on Twitter and Jocelyn Jackson on Instagram and Jocelyn Jackson on Facebook because who spells it like that? Nobody. So it's been really lucky to have this weird name. <laughs> I've also been able to get mine because that is, strangely, there's not that many Devellos out there. Uh, Margaret saying, examining the rep the reptile brain fear through the lens of story is a helpful angle and a worthy attempt. Margaret, as always with the, with the insights over there. Thank you. Um, so Jocelyn, let's go back to that reptilian brain, deep down fear. Um, sure. when you wrote this book about a woman whose child is snatched, clearly a fear that many of us, many mothers, or, you know, I, I am a mother of a dog. So dog mothers fear, <laughs> dog mothers, human mothers, all mothers fear is the loss of that little, that little, that beloved little creature. I mean, that that's deep down terror. Is that something that you had always been afraid of? Well, sure. I mean, if you've, if you've been in charge of a kid for a minute, you know, that stomach drop, like mm -hmm. they're, they're very um, escape artist oriented <laughs> little things. Um, and in that moment where this beloved part of you is gone, um, you know, like all these possibilities open up and you think 99, you know, it's going to be fine. It's this, 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 or this, but also all of these possibilities open up too. And you, it's like, you're standing at this crossroads that you don't know which road you're going to have to go down. I think it's, I think everybody has that that terror and life is just so is so unpredictable and you don't know, you know, you just don't know. So whenever anybody's at it and, and it's a myth that when somebody's in your sight, they're fine too. An asteroid could drop on you, but you, it feels safer, you know? So, yeah, I mean, I think that's a really primal, normal human fear. And to start with something, you know, that basic is an immediate adrenaline jump and I think like if you like the person, like I really do like Brie, it it's a big stakes raiser. So mm -hmm. I, I it comes out of character. I love that. Um, Liz from Facebook saying that uh, she agrees that authors are the worst audio narrators except Guyman. And she's going to give you a try, Jocelyn. <laughs> so I know you're going to love it. Love it, Liz. 
All right, we have just one minute left. We have 60 seconds. Get your last questions for Jocelyn going in the comments and I will get them right over to her. Um, meanwhile, I'll ask Jocelyn, if this, uh, let's talk, if this, if this is adapted for the big screen, who would you see playing Brie? Oh, um, I can't say. <laughs> I can't say. Okay, she's keeping us in suspense, everybody. She's keeping yeah, us I mean, in suspense. There, that might already be happening, and I might not be allowed to talk about it, and there might Ooh. already be something. I, but I mean, I'm not saying that, but I'm also not saying that. <laughs> All right, you heard it here on Mighty Mysteries first. Anissa saying, great chat. Thank you, ladies. Thank you for being here, Anissa. Jocelyn, what's one final thought you'd like to leave us with? Karen, a valued member of the Billies team, thank, saying thank you so much. Great to have you as always, Karen. Um, what's one thought you'd like to leave us? What's you know something that you wish I'd asked or something that you'd like us to, to a parting thought you'd like to leave us with? Um, just like, I guess my best writing advice, which is literature is a conversation. And if you want to be in that conversation, you need to be reading. Reading is listening. And when, when you are reading, especially the kind of things you're interested in writing, you want to talk back and you get in the conversation that's happening globally. Mm. I love that. Reading is listening. And I totally agree. What an amazing and wonderful chance to step into the pages um, of another person's point of view and life experience and to literally walk in their shoes and see life through their eyes. Something that I I know I really love. I know all readers love. Thank you for saying that so beautifully. Um, Jocelyn, always so joyful. Sylvia says, thank you. Sylvia, Gail saying, thank you. Jocelyn, thank you. AMB, thank you. Sarah, uh, Gail, always great to have you, a top community member here. Everybody, thank you so much for joining us. And I will see you at 4 p.m. with Saul Lelchuk. Um, and we'll uh, see you then. Jocelyn, thanks so much for joining us. Thank you so much for having me.